All right, so the church, part three, uh, according to scripture, we're kind of going to touch on why is why the church, um, and then also kind of uh, pull from last week uh, really quick and look at, um, um, gosh, I, I kind of forget what, it, oh yes, maintaining the status uh, of being the church. Why the church and then maintaining the status of being the church. So we're going to kind of fly through this. Uh, there's, there'll be some stuff on the screen, so make sure you screenshot it. And then also, the reason why I'm going to fly through this is because they're being recorded and they're going to be posted. So, all right, that's why I'm going to fly through it. Um, amen. Okay, so let's start uh, with just a quick recap uh, from last week and look at a couple points here. Um, uh, first of all, the church... Uh, the church is the bride of Christ, uh, or you can say it this way, the church is the woman that is to reflect the glory of her husband, of the man, which the man here is uh, likened to Christ. Um, Christ is the bridegroom, the church is the bride, uh, Christ is the man, the church is the woman. Okay, and, and the woman is to reflect uh, her husband in the earth until he returns. In fact, there's a Jewish custom uh, where that whenever uh, a, a, a young man and a, and a young woman, whenever they are espoused to one another, oftentimes what happens in the Jewish custom is that uh, the man would go away and begin to prepare a place, prepare a home uh, for them to live together. This is Jewish custom, okay? And when that place got finally fully ready, then the young man would come back and bring uh, his bride with him, and then they would consummate uh, the marriage. Okay. Now that's really powerful that that's uh, that a, that is an Orthodox Jewish custom. That's really powerful because our Bible, uh, Jesus kind of pulled from that from that custom that the Jews had. And he sort of mentioned that in John chapter 14. He said, I, Behold, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. Amen. So it's the, it's the bridegroom preparing the place right now to come back for his bride. You know, that's our, that's, that's our ultimate purpose and desire, or at least, ladies and gentlemen, it should be. Amen. This is why we cannot afford to get bogged down with the irritations of life and with the lust of the flesh and the lust of eyes. People going to irritate you, okay? Pastor Chris is probably going to irritate some of you every other day, okay? I'm, I'm just keeping it real. Um, so <laughs> don't. we can't get bogged down with the irritations of life, with the cares of life. There is a transcendent reward that once you fully get a glimpse of that thing, you're going to wonder why you even spent more than five minutes wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in all the mess of this world and letting that bother you. Amen. I'm not saying we're robots and we don't have feelings and we'll never get you know, flustered by things. But I am saying as we mature, those, those irritations need to bother us less and less. Uh, it needs to be short-lived. It needs to become shorter and shorter and shorter lived. We know that we are maturing in Christ and in our relationship with him when things around us begin to irritate us less and less and less and less. Why? Because we know that we are just pilgrims passing through. We are fully assured of that in our spirit, and it has become a preeminent way of life, a preeminent mentality in us. Amen. So that's, that's the first recap point. We're called out. We're the called out ones, God's own special people. We're in holy nation. Okay, quickly, the next thing. We are the ambassadors of the coming, excuse me, the coming physical kingdom of God. We are the ambassadors of the coming physical kingdom of God uh, that shall be established upon this earth for a thousand years. There is a kingdom coming that will destroy and put down all the kingdoms and nations of men. And in that day, the Bible says, there shall be one Lord, 
and his name one. And he's going to sit upon the throne of David and rule with righteousness and perfect justice. Amen. And that is what is missing in this fallen world that we live, right? There, we live in a world where there's so much unrighteousness, so much injustice, praise God, so much mercilessness. And that's really, it's, it's, you can sum it up in one word. It's just sin. It's missing the mark of God. It is iniquity that is abounding. And it is because of that that we have all of the problems. All of the problems in our world is traced back to iniquity. It's traced back to people, to us as human beings, choosing our way over God's way. Amen. Uh, but one day that's all going to change. And that's why we've got to stay focused, because when he comes back, we're going to be with him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, the next point here, an individual, uh, of course, we talked about this last week, but an individual must be born of water and of the spirit if he or she is to gain full access to the kingdom. Water baptism puts us in Christ. And let me kind of show the quick recap screen here. Water baptism puts us in Christ and spirit baptism puts Christ in us. Right. Uh, and so the only biblical, the only biblically sound water baptism, the only I want, I want us to hear this uh, because we got to re solidify, re -solidif <laughs> re solidify this in our spirit over and over again, because the enemy would try to steal stuff and pervert stuff. The only biblically sound water baptism and thus the only one that activates its benefits is by immersion, by full immersion and calling on the name of Jesus. Now, many of you know that to be true. Those of you who may not fully understand that, I don't have time to go through all of the passages and all of the teaching to defend that point, but it's all through the Bible. I don't care what church tradition says, and I don't care that people say, well, you know, it's not that big a deal. Well, I tell you what, what God puts in his word, I am not going to look at it and say, eh, that's not that big a deal. I don't want to be in that boat. I'm not playing roulette with my soul. I, you know, if it's a temporary thing, I might, I might be willing to gamble. <laughs> but we're talking about an eternal thing. I'm not willing to play roulette and roll the dice with my soul. And if we're wise, you shouldn't either. Uh, but here are just some passages to jot down uh, to kind of uh, back up this, this, this teaching of Scripture. Uh, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Acts chapter 15, verse 17. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And Acts chapter 10, verse 47. Those are just... A handful. Amen. Uh, the next point here, the only way to know for certain that we have been born of the Spirit is when a believer worships and prays and declares the wonderful works of God in another tongue or language not known to them as the Spirit prompts them to do so. That is the only way to know for certain that we have experienced what Jesus said must take place in order for us to enter the kingdom of God, and that is to be born of water and of the Spirit. The only way to know for certain biblically that, a, that we have been born of the Spirit is when God uh, gives us the utterance, comes upon us, moves upon us as we are worshiping him and we begin to speak with other tongues. And this, it, it's not meant to be a one-time experience. It's meant to happen and become a part of our worship and prayer life. Uh, but the initial moment that happens, we can rest assured, I've, I've been born of the Spirit. And, and this is my, now some people may say, well, you know, you could, how do you know? You might have already been born of the Spirit. 
uh, and hadn't spoken with, spoken with other tongues or whatever, well, if, if somebody wants to run with that, be my guest. But the only way to know for sure is when we've spoken in other tongues. Amen. Um, now, this should not be confused with the gift of diverse kinds of tongues. That's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Any believer, any believer who has not had this experience or has not spoken in, another, in other tongues in a long, long while should prioritize seeking God's promise uh, by, via surrendered worship and passionate prayer until they break through to this experience. Because this becomes the premier purpose and the premier uh, thing in somebody's life if they have not broken through to this yet. It should become the premier pursuit of a person's life, of a believer's life. Amen. So, water, spirit. Um, this was this is sort of recap from um, who the church is. How do I become a part of the body of Christ? Okay. All right. Now, um, of course, we lastly we mentioned that water baptism is a work of obedient faith that activates Christ's blood to retroactively cleanse us of all past sin. And that same blood remains activated to cleanse us of future sin if we confess those sins and ask his forgiveness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 and 9. And then now spirit baptism is a gift and a promise to those who have diligently sought him and operates proactively, empowering us to conquer sin. That's what spirit baptism does. Amen. All right, so now quickly moving on from that, uh, just hit some highlights here and details in, in, in part three, uh, and look at sort of why uh, the church, why the church, and maintaining the status of being a part of God's body. Uh, first of all, I believe 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, sums up the what, the who, and the why of the church on a basic elementary level. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Now, of course, we've looked at this passage uh, each session of this particular study, and uh, we're going to look at it one more time. Um, the who, what, and why uh, summary of the church, First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. And the part, portion that I've highlighted in red here is the why, in summary. Okay. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That, in summary, in, in a basic nutshell, is the why of the church of the living God in the earth. That we show forth the praises of God, the one who's called us out of darkness, the one who's been merciful to us. Because, as verse 10 says, in time past, we were not a people, but now we are the people of Almighty God. And we had not obtained mercy, but now, thanks be to God, and through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now obtaining the mercy of Almighty God. So that's, that's the why, in a nutshell. I could basically end this Bible study tonight, and, and you can kind of take that and run with it. Um, but we'll mention a couple more things. Um, Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. I want to kind of look at that to make a link here that I think will be helpful. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. I'll read here from the New King James. <clears throat> now, this is picking up right in the middle of a, of, a, uh, of a story here in Revelation 17, right in the middle of a, sort of a, a paragraph. Uh, so we'll kind of expound and, and explain that. 
but these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him, listen to this, are called, chosen, and faithful. Now this is important, because if we're going to do the will of God, and if we're going to uh, uh, go with him, when he comes back to take us to what he's prepared for us, we've got to be more than just called. That's great. He has called us out of darkness, right? Now, once we answer that call, or if a person answers that call, then they become chosen. But just being called and just being chosen will not by itself result in your eternal salvation. We must be faithful to the end. So him, those who are with him, are called and chosen, and they remain faithful. That's what will be said of those people. Praise God. So we've got to understand that. We thank God for the call. We thank God for the, for the, uh, the new birth message, the, the moment of conversion. But we need to remain faithful to God and continually be conformed into his image if we're going to see the glory of God revealed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I look forward to the continued unfolding of the glory and power of God while I yet remain on this earth in this life, that God would use me and use you uh, to advance his kingdom in our communities, in the world. That needs to be the focus of the church. The focus of the church should not be an inward focus. It should be an outward expansion focus. This is why we cannot afford to see church services as our primary purpose. A church service is not the primary purpose of the church of the living God. A church service, whether that be what we're doing tonight, having a Bible study, or what we do on Sunday. See, for decades and decades and decades and throughout time, uh, the, the institutional church uh, has primarily promoted and leaned on this Sunday mentality, right? In fact, for most people, for probably 80% of professing Christians, the only time they ever fellowship with a body of believers is on Sunday. And when you talk to people about church, the first thing that, that comes to their mind is a Sunday service and the building. Now, all of that, ladies and gentlemen, is a part of being God's church. We are commanded by God to come together and fellowship regularly, amen, and pray and uh, receive the word of the Lord and worship God together. But all of that is for folks who are already believers. Amen. The Bible says, God chose the foolishness, foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Amen. But the primary function and purpose of the church is to show forth his praises, is to be ambassadors to this world. You know, when you have uh, ambassadors go from one nation to another nation, you know what, what they're going to, like, so for instance, if you have the ambassador, uh, the United States ambassador to say, uh, I don't know, uh, name a nation, Australia, okay? And we have an ambassador to Australia. He is, he is boots on the ground, or she is boots on the ground in Australia to promote the interests of the United States. And the scriptures call us ambassadors of God and of his kingdom. So we are in this earth then, as believers, to constantly be promoting the interests of God and his kingdom. There is literally no greater purpose for your existence if you are a child of God, born again into his kingdom, 
than to be in this world daily reflecting God's glory and promoting his interests. There is nothing. It's not being able to uh, save up a down payment to buy your dream house. It's not uh, being able to get into your favorite car. It's not trying to stack as much money as you possibly can. And while you're busy doing that, you're losing your soul because you're, 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 you're not gathering the body like you should or you're not praying like you should anymore or you're not studying the word of God and you're losing the fire because you're, you, you have, we have prioritized the stuff that the system of this world says is priority. Amen. But Jesus said that your priority ought to be the kingdom and its righteousness. Is that not what the book says? Amen. So, so I want to. I, I want. If I'm a believer, I want to prioritize what God says. We ought to prioritize, and He will take care of the rest. Hallelujah. Amen. So. Uh, Second Peter, we just talked about called, chosen, and faithful. Second Peter chapter 3 reveals to us the ultimate will of God in this period of time called exist, uh, in this, <laughs> this period of existence called time. He reveals to us what his ultimate will is, right? You've got sub wills of God, and all of the sub wills of God are there to feed the ultimate will of God, right? And that is that no one would perish. That no one would perish. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Now we understand, unfortunately, when it's all said and done, there's going to be people that perish. But it is not the will of God. And because it is not the will of our God, it should not be our will either we should not have it in our hearts that oh well you know whatever you know some people are going to make it some people are not going to make it we should still have the heartbeat of god concerning what his will is for his church his ambassadors in the earth and if it's the will of my savior that none perish then it's my will that none perish so I'm going to be as uh, submitted to the will of God myself as much as possible so that I am in a place, a mindset, a position, a flow with God that I can be as effective for God as possible with the time that I have left on this planet. That's the goal. That should be the goal of every born-again believer to be as submitted to God as possible so that therefore me as his vessel, I can be as effective for his kingdom as possible. Because the more effective I am results in more souls being saved. I want us to understand that that's a link. It's a link. The two are linked. It's not my job to save the souls. I'm not the one given the increase. But I am the one that God uses to water and plant. And if I'm constantly distracted, constantly letting life beat me down, and then, you know, saying, woe is me about it, feel bad for me. Well, you know, every human being on the planet could say, what, 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 could say that. If I'm saying that, somebody else could say that even more than I could. You know, and, and, and that's not, hey, that's not me on here minimizing the struggles we face. But I am saying there is one greater that if we will submit ourselves to him and cast it to him, we, we don't have to have this roller coaster ride of emotional stress. <laughs> Amen. We can, we can have our burdens uh, 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 wrapped up in God's arms and he, and he handle it for us so that we can remain focused as good soldiers on the battlefield. Amen. That's the privilege we have. So, so the church, the church is the entity or the, let me say it this way, we are the embassy, 
by which God primarily appeals to those who are not yet a part of his kingdom. There is uh, the Israeli embassy several years ago before Donald Trump took office uh, the first term. Um, I think it was 2017 where this happened. Uh, the United States embassy in Israel was previously in Tel Aviv. Okay, but Donald Trump and his administration thought that the interests of the United States of America would best be served in what he felt was the eternal capital of Jerusalem or of Israel, which was Jerusalem. He felt like their interests could best be served by positioning the embassy in the best possible geographical location. And we are the embassy of God, the church. And so he positions us, oh my goodness, he positions us in the best possible spiritual location and the best possible uh, physical location. And he uh, allows us to be positioned in circumstances and situations where that he and his interest and the interest of the kingdom can be can best be served amen uh, is this uh, are y'all are y'all under y'all getting what i'm saying here uh i'm, I'm trying my best yeah, to relate you. this yeah you're doing a good job thank you but god is wanting us to understand who we are and why we are amen we are we are here's another way of looking at it looking at this we are conduits of the Holy Ghost. And I assume you all know what a conduit is. If you don't, I'm showing you one on the screen right now. <laughs> Praise God. We are conduits of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the church is his main conduit. God has ways of working in the world. God has ways of, uh, you know, by his power and his sovereignty kind of doing things. But he has bound himself so that his main way of operating in the world is through his church. So then we become like a conduit for God. We become like a conduit for his spirit and for his power to flow as he wishes in the earth. And you know what conduit, you, you know, you know how what conduits have to be in order so that the power that needs to flow from wherever it needs to flow from the source to wherever you live or wherever the power is needed, the only thing conduits have to be is dead. <laughs> conduits don't have their own life, their own will. They're just these metal poles through which uh, electrical wires uh, run and power flows through those conduits and those pipes, and the pipes just need to be dead. They don't need to have their own will trying to connect and go where they want to go. They need to just be tools in the hands of the person that have created them so that power can flow through them and, and accomplish what the power uh, is needed for. And we are like the conduits of God, or at least we're supposed to be. We're supposed to strive for that. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. Praise the name of the living God. I want to be a conduit. I want to be a conduit. I, I'm striving for that more and more and more. Amen. That my flesh not have the better of me, but the spirit of the living God and the word of God uh, dictates what the choices I make. Hallelujah. So important. So the church is his main conduit. And it is to reflect his image, declare his message, and release his his power in Jesus name. Amen. Um, and so we can, and I'm going to end with, with these next set of passages, but we can most effectively accomplish this. And all of this is a part of the why all of this is a part of maintaining uh, our status in the kingdom of God and not being backsliders, not becoming lukewarm, not becoming indifferent, but remaining uh, fired up, steadfast, unmovable in the work of the Lord. Amen. 
And so there are some passages that we can look to to show us how we can be most effective in accomplishing this status. Amen. And first one I want to look to real quick here is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. And I'm not going to read all of these passages on the screen. They're on the screen so that if you want to write them down and, and, and look into them and study uh, later, you can. But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, I will, I will go through that really quickly. Uh, and this is from the New American Standard Version. It says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, here's, here's that word prisoner again, okay? Uh, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. There's a way, there's a way that, that, that we can accomplish being called of God effectively. And the apostle says, walk in, the, in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. It's not enough to just be called. What makes the calling effective is when we walk in a manner worthy of that call. Uh, and, and then in verse 2 he says, and that is with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit. Praise God. Amen. So that's Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. Uh, I mentioned uh, verse 1 through 6, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to re read the rest of it. All right, now, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. I will quickly read this one as well. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Listen to the, to the verbiage, the language that is used in this pa passage. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? In other words, this is not a right. This is a privilege to be called a son of God. And it's a great manifestation of God's love. Then he says in verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And verse 3 to me is, if you're looking at it, verse 3 to me is what really kind of pull this, pulls this all together. Everything he said in verse 1 and 2 is solidified by, by verse 3. He says, and every man that has this hope, what hope? Being a son of God, and when he shall appear, we shall see him, be with him, and be like him. Every man, every individual that has this hope in him, what, is, what, what should he do? Purify himself even as God is pure. Hallelujah. Now, remember, these passage, passages here, we're talking about scriptures that tell us how we can be as effective as possible in our call to be God's ambassadors. And God's called us to peace. He's called us to the unity of the Spirit. He's called us to purity. Praise the name of Jesus. Uh, and just, just a couple more here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. Aren't you glad about that? The Lord knows. He also knows the pretenders. He also knows the phonies. He knows the ones that names the name of, of Christ. He knows the one that says, yeah, I'm a Christian too. But then he knows the ones that are actually his. Praise God. Amen. Not everyone that comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, Matthew chapter 7. It's not everybody, but he knows. 
the ones who are. He says, let everyone, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, the last part here, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Remember at the beginning of this, I said it is iniquity, it is by iniquity that all of the issues, problems, degradation, evils, wickedness of our world is exists. And the scripture says, if you've become a believer and now you're claiming the name of Christ, your, your, your number one priority is to depart from iniquity. Why? Because when iniquity is removed, it changes the whole world. If we could have a world where everybody was following the will of God, there would be zero issues. I've come to tell you tonight, that kind of a world is just around the corner. For when God splits the, splits the skies and he comes with the sound of the trumpet, hallelujah, and he comes with a great shout and he returns and we are caught up together to meet him in the air and we return to the earth after the marriage supper of the, supper of the Lamb, hallelujah, to rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. It is that thousand years kingdom that will show us what it's like when iniquity is removed from the earth. Praise God. God. And that is why God calls us to, to, to uh, uh, depart from iniquity. Because iniquity is the problem for all of us. It's not, it's not because God just, you know, he wants everything this way and he wants you to be, he's not trying to be just a dictator or, 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 or whatever. He knows that your problem and my problem is iniquity. And in order to give us the best life possible, he shows us in his word how to attain that. Thank you, Jesus. He's a good God. He's a great God. Amen. All right. I'm about to wrap up here. Um, and uh, let me, uh, the last thing that I'm going to look at is 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 10 through 14. And I'm going to read fast, okay? 1 First, First Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 14. He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Let me say that part again. Let him seek, seek peace. Seek it. We, we seek peace. We don't just hope it shows up. We don't just expect somebody else to be the peacemaker. No, we, we as the people of God, we seek peace. And we don't just seek it, we pursue after it. Amen. Watch this. Verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and, he, and his ears are open to their prayers. I said this, uh, I remember saying this a, a few weeks ago uh, during one of our Sunday services, and the Lord prompted it in my spirit, and I'm going to say it here again. Your, your prayers and my prayers are never more effective than when we are constantly living a righteous life, seeking peace and pursuing it. That's how we have effective prayers. That, you know, people say, you know, I, I, I you know, I'm a, I'm a one God, apostolic, whatever. That don't mean nothing if you're not living righteous, if you're not loving your brother, if you're not seeking peace and pursuing it. That is how, when we begin to pray in the name of Jesus, that's how it is effective. The more that we are walking with God in righteousness and peace is the more powerful your prayers are when you pray. Praise God. And then he says, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The word evil there is the same Greek word for, translated iniquity iniquity. Amen. All right, so last thing here, and we'll close this out. Being a part of God's church, being a part of God's church is not, somebody say is not. Is not. It is not about having an all-powerful being 
that you can appeal to here and there to do something about the issues of your life. And, and, and the trouble is, some folks, when God does come through for them and blesses them abundantly and, and they receive uh, favor of God and miracles of God and open doors that they've been believing for for however, however long, as soon as they get it, now they're, now, now, now they're acting different. Now they're not as committed to God because now, now they got their blessing. Now that's become the biggest deal in their life. It's like when they were, it's like in the scripture, that parable that talks about Jesus uh, gave a parable about uh, a great feast that a king was putting on and he was inviting everybody to the feast. And his servants went out and began to invite everybody. And, and these were the people's excuses. Oh, you know, I just bought. I just bought a piece of land and, you know, I got to deal with it. I got to tend to it. I got business to take care of. So I can't come. And I, even though you blessed me, Lord, now, now because of the blessing, I, I'm less fired up for you. I'm less involved. I'm, I'm a little apathetic now. I, I've got the world on my mind and money on my mind and other things on my mind. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> so, so he's not... It's not about having uh, this, this, this all-powerful being that can just give you, bless you, who you can come and appeal to. Because you know what? That hasn't worked out very well for God over the, over, over, <laughs> over the history of humanity. People just, they get stuff and, they, and they, now, now their commitment's reduced. Now you don't see them as much. Now they're not as fired up because something's distracting them. And another one said, yeah, you know, I just, I just, I just married a wife. I, I gotta go. I gotta go meet her needs. And then the last one said, "Oh well, you know, I just bought a yoke of oxen." That that in modern times, you know what that means? The guy just bought a new Ferrari, just bought a nice Jaguar, just got him that new Tesla, and he's got to he's got to go show it off to the family and to the boys and to the friends. We get distracted. Blessings. If we're not careful and if we're not ready for them and if we don't have the right spirit, these so-called material blessings and things that we want in this life that we're so desperate for can be the biggest distraction in our lives when it comes to serving God. Amen. So that's not what this is for. That's not what being a part of God's church is about. Being a part of God's church is about reflecting his glory, doing his will, and living out his purpose. That's it. That's the purpose. Amen. I wish some. I'm, I'm Amen. Gonna, I'm gonna sit my Amen. Words until somebody lets this sink in. <laughs> That's the Amen. purpose. We're to reflect His glory, do His will, live out His purpose. And if we will, if we will give ourselves to that we will then see why God said to do that. See, it's, 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 it's harder to explain it. But once you get a hold of it and experience the blessing of it, because that's a real blessing, you see, what comes as a result of reflecting his glory, doing his will, and living out his purpose, that's true blessing. That's blessing that adds no sorrow to it. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich, and adds no sorrow to it. But the blessing that our flesh constantly is looking for, oh, that's going to add some sorrow. I can tell you that. Because, because what, what happens is we tend to kind of do what we want and, and you know, move according to the beat of our feelings and emotions, and then uh, the God that produced the blessing now becomes on the back burner. Oh, Lord, help us. But I will end with this passage here. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 through 17. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world. And the world is passing away, 
and the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Hallelujah. The question is, are we only interested in temporary pleasures and that's the greatest joy of being a Christian is that we have the pleasure of having God meet our needs when we go to prayer and say, oh God, I got this and I got that. Or is it to abide forever with the King of glory? Because the world's passing away. Oh yeah, God can give us X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, but all of that's passing away anyway. So what God is wanting to help us to get to is to, to, to think and operate mentally on a transcendent level where it's not just our, our Christian life is not just tied to what's happening in our day-to-day -day life, but we're looking to the hills. We're looking transcendently. Amen. And we're seeing the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. I wonder if we'll just for a moment here, I'm done. Why don't we just lift our hands if you can with me, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever mood you're in, God's not concerned about that right now. He's looking for obedience. He's looking for somebody to say, I trust you. I trust you, Jesus. I don't care how I feel. I don't care what's going on around me. I don't care what circumstances I'm facing. I don't care how tired I might be. I am going to surrender and trust the one who has always been faithful to me. Hallelujah, Jesus. I need you, Lord. I want to be your ambassador. I want to be a part of the church according to the scriptures. I want to be an ambassador of the living God. Hallelujah. I want to be your embassy on the uh, earth the for Jesus. the kingdom of Jesus Christ, Lord. That is my primary purpose, and That's that good. is what brings the joy. The joy is in Yield. The joy is in is in doing the will of God. Hallelujah. This is the what and the who and the why of the church of the living God. You said that you would build your church, Lord God, but we are to promote your kingdom. You build your church, we promote the kingdom. We That's right. Wherever we go, we sow it wherever we are. Hallelujah. We minister, hallelujah, and, and, and promote the interests of our Savior wherever we may be and whatever circumstances we might be in. Hallelujah. Sometimes our greatest test is how we're going to react in our greatest trial. Hallelujah. Are we going to continue to promote the peace? and be the ambassador is that still going to be the primary focus of our life? or are we going to succumb to the trial hallelujah are we going to succumb to the season of difficulty oh, oh lord god i am now and i want to always be your ambassador oh jesus thank you jesus for the joy of the lord is our strength the joy of our lord that's where we get our strength. Jesus. I, I thank you, Jesus. I trust you. Thank you, Jesus. I worship your holy name. The Lord of the Lord is our strength. Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Love each and every one of you. Thankful for y'all. And uh, let this word remain in your spirit. Uh, they will be all three of the parts to this will be posted over the next week or so and uh, i would encourage you to go back and listen to each part and yes. uh, be reminded and let god mold you into his image i think sometimes we have a particular way of thinking of things and and a lot of a lot of those ways sometimes is just not biblical it's just not uh, what god has called us to be and we want to be conformed to the image of his dear son that's the call to the Amen. people of god Amen. Amen.